The following is a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version. Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1132 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL files comments on the FCC Draft World Radio Communications Conference recommendations. The recent threat from Hurricane Eta, a Category 4 hurricane, prompted an amateur activation. The International Space Station recently celebrated 20 years with a crew on board. A clean sweep in the ARRL November sweepstakes means working 84 sections this year. And the FCC clears the way for digital AM broadcasting in the United States. We will have all the details coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will solve the mysterious case of the malicious PDF. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will relate the story of why hams in Schenectady, New York, can't drive down Weaver Street. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about maintenance of your tower guy lines. All of that is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where the weather has gone from having seven inches of snow outside to being plus 75 degrees today and sunny. If you're in New York, if you don't like the weather, you just wait a minute. I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from historic Armory Square from the Museum of Science and Technology in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. As we enjoy a second Indian summer high atop Sand Hill here in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One in Paradise, oops, I mean Central Florida, this is Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. This is W2XBS and the This Week in Amateur Radio newsroom with some late breaking news as we come to air this week. Kristen McIntyre, K6WX of San Jose, California, has assumed the office of ARRL Pacific Division Director following the recent vacancy in the office. The ARRL Articles of Association stipulate that she will serve as director for the remainder of the current term, which expires on December 31, 2022. She will join the league's board, which is comprised of the organization's 15 directors, each representing a geographical area. McIntyre was appointed as a division vice director in 2018 and was unopposed as a candidate for the position in 2019. She was first licensed in the late 1970s while a student at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She holds an amateur extra class license. She has served as ARRL technical coordinator for the East Bay section and as a member of the Palo Alto Amateur Radio Club. McIntyre also is licensed in Japan, her second home, as JI1IZZ. She is a senior software engineer at Apple. Leading off our news this week, the ARRL has submitted comments on two draft recommendations approved in October by the FCC's World Radio Communication Conference Advisory Committee. With more details on the comments filed by the ARRL, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The comments focus on draft recommendations for World Radio Communication Conference 2023. 
Agenda item 1.2 will consider the identification of frequencies in the 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz and 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz bands, among others, for international mobile telecommunications, including possible additional allocations to the mobile service on a primary basis. ARRL urged no change to the 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz and 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz amateur allocations. Radio amateurs make substantial use of both bands, ARRL said in its comments. They have conducted experiments and designed systems that protect primary users. The lack of interference complaints is evidence that they have been successful in doing so. In this manner, new spectrum horizons are explored and new techniques are developed that put spectrum to productive use that otherwise would represent lost opportunities and waste of the natural resource. End quote. ARRL said it wanted to reaffirm that these secondary allocations continue to be important and useful and that WRC 23 should not consider changing either secondary allocation. Sharing between primary users and secondary amateur radio users has been highly successful and the U.S. domestic table reflected the international allocations until this year, the ARRL said. In September, however, the FCC adopted an order to delete the secondary amateur and amateur satellite allocations in the 3.3 to 3.5 gigahertz band. Amateur radio operations may continue on a secondary basis subject to decisions to be made on issues raised in a further notice of proposed rulemaking in the proceeding, which is WT Docket 19-348. ARRL maintained that amateur radio should remain secondary in the international allocations at 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz until more is known about the technical characteristics of equipment that will be used by the new services and the extent of geographic buildout. With regard to 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz, the ARRL noted that it has been used for many amateur terrestrial experiments and tests that have helped to develop the technical characteristics of the band. The band also is heavily used throughout much of the world as a downlink for the Qatari amateur satellite East Hale 2 QO100. ARRL noted that radio amateurs utilizing the secondary spectrum at 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz and 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz have developed and honed their equipment and capabilities to share with existing services. The amateur service has earned its reputation for making careful and non-preclusive use of its secondary allocations and will continue to do so, the ARRL concluded. Therefore, we respectfully request that the amateur service and amateur satellite service be continued as secondary services in the above bands. As Hurricane Eta increased to a major Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 140 miles per hour on track to landfall along the Nicaraguan coast, WX4NHC at the National Hurricane Center activated, monitoring 14.325 MHz and 7.268 MHz, the frequencies used by the Hurricane WatchNet, as well as the Voice over IP Hurricane Net, WinLink, APRS, and other modes. As of Tuesday evening, ETA was not threatening the U.S. mainland, and the Hurricane WatchNet had not announced any activation plans, but was at Level 3 alert level. As of 2100 UTC on Tuesday, the eye wall of what the National Hurricane Center is calling extremely dangerous Hurricane Eta was making landfall just south of Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua. The National Hurricane Center warned of a life-threatening storm surge, catastrophic winds, flash flooding, and landslides across portions of Central America. Eta was moving to the west at a rather sluggish 3 miles per hour. The NHC said ETA was forecast to move farther inland over northern Nicaragua through Wednesday morning and then move across central Honduras by Thursday morning. This will be another historic hurricane to hit this area during what has been an historic active season, said Assistant Amateur Radio Coordinator Julio Rapol, WD4R, at the National Hurricane Center. Rapol asked stations to relay any reports from stations or ships at sea in the affected area with or without weather data for use by National Hurricane Center forecasters. The National Hurricane Center appreciates all the surface reports from the affected area during hurricanes as they fill in gaps of not just weather data, 
but also give them real-time, first-person perspective of what is actually happening on the ground, Rapal said. The International Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee held its fourth meeting of the year via Zoom in three parts to replace an in-person meeting not possible due to the pandemic. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with the details in this report filed from League Headquarters. In the first session on October 21st, Region 2 President Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK, reviewed the year since the October 2019 Lima General Assembly, highlighting the new initiatives Region 2 has undertaken. These included the appointment of a youth liaison and the introduction of workshops, as well as the work of the Band Planning Committee to coordinate with Regions 1 and 3 on a number of issues. Secretary George Gorslein, VE3YV, presented a proposed 2021 strategic plan for discussion. Session 2 on October 24th was Coordinators Day. Each Region 2 coordinator was invited to give a presentation on their function and recent activities. The four-hour session reviewed the breadth of amateur radio activities in Region 2. The presentations will be posted on the IARU Region 2 website. Region 2 also took part in a Futures Committee, which will develop a strategy and plans for updating the IARU organization to be more effective in dealing with the challenges of rapidly evolving telecommunications ecosystem, an IARU Region 2 news release said. Session 2 is October 24th, which is Coordinators Day. The third and final session, on October 28th, continued the discussion on planning and budget for fiscal year 2021. The pandemic has created considerable disruption this year, and how long that may be continuing is uncertain, an executive committee news release said. Well, these challenges are also the opportunities created by the rapid acceptance of virtual meetings for improved outreach to broaden participation by member societies and all amateurs in the Americas. A special session to approve the finalized budget will be scheduled later in the year. Happy anniversary to the International Space Station, which on November 2nd marked 20 years of having a crew on board continuously. This is an occasion being celebrated by the five space agencies involved in the ISS project. NASA, Roscosmos, ESA, JAXA, and CSA. Of note is the role amateur radio has played up there through the ARIES program. Amateur radio was already part of the Expedition 1 crew who arrived on board November 2, 2000. Commander William Shepard, KD-5GSL, Soyuz Commander Yuri Gizensko, and Flight Engineer Sergei Kirikov, U-5MIR. The Radio Amateurs of Canada Board of Directors is pleased to announce that Brent Taylor, VY2HF, has been appointed as a trustee for the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. Brent lives in Stratford, Prince Edward Island with his wife Janice. He will be representing the province of Prince Edward Island for a three-year term from September 2020 until September 2023. Brent replaces Ella McCormick. VE1PEI, who served on the board from 2015 to July of 2020. The RAC Board and the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame Board of Trustees extend sincere appreciation to Ella for her dedication and contributions to the board evaluation process over the years. We wish her all the best of success in her future endeavors. Brent Taylor, VY2HF, was first licensed in 1984 as VE1APG and received his partial HF privileges six months later after demonstrating successful CW operation. One year later, he passed his advanced examination. He obtained the call VE1JH and was known by the call for over 20 years. He then moved from New Brunswick to Prince Edward Island in 2007 and acquired the call VY2HF. Brent believes strongly in supporting amateur radio organizations. He is past president of the Fredericton Amateur Radio Club and the New Brunswick Amateur Radio Association. He was also involved with the Canadian Amateur Radio Federation and the Canadian Radio Relay League before the merger into Radio Amateurs of Canada. He is a member of RAC, the Charlottetown Amateur Radio Club, the International Repeater Group, the American Radio Relay League, the Radio Society of Great Britain, AMSAT, the National Radio Club, and the Canadian International DX Club. 
Brent works for the Federal Department of Veteran Affairs as the acting manager of the department's business systems unit with responsibility over the database that holds the department's veteran and client information. Prior to that, he was a member of the Veterans Review and Appeal Board for 10 years and previously worked as an educator, radio broadcaster, newspaper columnist, and served one term as a member of the New Brunswick Legislative Assembly. I am very pleased to be invited to join the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame Board of Trustees as a representative from Prince Edward Island. I believe I have a good sense of the kinds of achievements that would be worthy of Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame recognition. I have had some very capable and generous Elmers over the years and have interacted with a wide range of amateurs from all walks of life. The ever-popular ARRL November Sweepstakes weekends are upon us, the first for CW and the other for SSB, and this year, participants will have to search out an additional section. With more details on this year's sweepstakes, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Linquist, WW1ME, files this report. The CW event takes place November 7th through the 9th UTC. The SSB event is from November 20th to the 23rd UTC. Stations may operate 24 of the available 30 hours. An SS operating guide package available via the sweepstakes webpage explains how to participate. This year marks the 79th sweepstakes event. The number of ARRL and Radio Amateurs of Canada sections rose to 84 earlier this year, with the addition of Prince Edward Island Canada as a separate entity. The objective of SS, or sweeps, is to work as many stations in as many of the 84 sections as possible within 24 hours of operating. The number of sections worked is a score multiplier, and working all of them, a clean sweep in sweepstakes terminology, is the goal of many SS aficionados. Now here's the good part, you don't need a big station to have fun in sweepstakes. ARRL November Sweepstakes is the oldest domestic radio sport event, the first was in 1930, and the SS Contest Exchange has deep roots in message handling protocol. In sweepstakes, stations exchange a serial number, operating category or precedence, call sign, check, the last two digits of the year of first license for either operator or station, and your section. Details are at www.arrl.org forward slash sweepstakes. Clubs or public service teams that are considering participating in sweepstakes will find the guide to be a useful source for information. This year marks the 79th sweepstakes event, which attracts more than 3,000 entries each fall for both weekends. Some multipliers are rarer and or harder to work, and these can vary from year to year. For many years, the most difficult sweepstakes multiplier was considered to be Northern Territories in Canada, where Jay Allen, VY1JA and Yukon Territory was often the only station available. Allen has stepped back from amateur radio, however, owing to health issues. Making a clean sweep also requires working Alaska and Hawaii, or another station in the Pacific section, as well as Newfoundland and Labrador, and Prince Edward Island in the other direction. On the rarer side, finding and working stations in Alberta, North Dakota, Northern New York, U.S. Virgin Islands, Wyoming, and Delaware has proven vexing for some sweepstakes operators. Nonetheless, even stations with modest equipment and antennas can enjoy success. Many stations like to operate in the QRP category, which is output of 5 watts or less, although that challenge has been more daunting in the lower rungs of the solar cycle. The Sweepstakes Operating Guide package, available for download, includes all rules and examples of log formatting. The deadline to submit CW entries is November 16th. The deadline to submit phone entries is November 29th. Direct questions to the ARRL contest program. There are hams who enjoy vintage rigs and antique straight keys, like myself. But how about hams who appreciate historic publications about radio? Iulian Rosu, YO3DAC, slash VA3IUL, is an accomplished QRP contester in Romania who loves home brew in addition to QRP operating. He's one of those enthusiasts, and now he's sharing free downloadable PDFs of some old books about radio that date back as much as 100 years. 
The titles include the Wireless Experimenter's Manual by E. Boucher, published in 1920, and Radio Miracle of the 20th Century by F. Dinker and J. Lewis, published in 1922. He also has a collection of old radio magazines in downloadable format, publications such as the Archive Collection of Radio Times, dating to 1923, and the Wireless Constructor from 1926. There's even a General Electric Handbook on Sideband, first published in 1961. They're all there, and for the curious as well as the collector, point your digital device on the web to www.qsl.net slash va3iul slash files slash old underscore radio underscore frequency underscore books dot atm. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here, your tech guy. The case of the malicious PDF next. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo, this is rather strange. A guy came out to give me an estimate for a new furnace. Reputable company. They just installed a new water heater. He sent me an email with a PDF of the quote for the installation. After I downloaded it, my Norton antivirus said that a script that could enable malware had been removed from the PDF. I, I guess it was sanitizing it. My question is, was the sender maliciously responsible for placing the script on the PDF? And if, if that's the case, I, I guess I should bring it to the company as well as him. Or could there be an innocent explanation for this? Thanks for any insight. There are a lot of explanations for this, so I'll give you the whole realm of possibilities here. I can't tell you for sure what happened, but here's some of the things that could have happened. First uh, explanation for those of you who don't know, it's a PDF stands for Portable Document Format. It was a document format originally created by Adobe, but it's now kind of open and available, and there are lots of PDF creation tools and PDF reading tools. The advantage of a PDF, it's really good for things like invoices, tax returns, any kind of form, because you can create it and preserve the layout. Essentially, unlike a Word document, a word processing document, it's a picture of the document. So with anything with fields and forms and layout, it's going to look exactly like it looks on your computer, on everybody else's computer. That's the portability part. It can be taken anywhere and it will look the same. PDFs have additional format uh, or features, rather. You Sometimes there are forms that you can fill out, stamp your signature on it, things like that. But it's often used as kind of, and I think it's better to use, frankly, than, say, a Microsoft Word document for sending out things like invoices. You're pre you can be pretty sure that no matter what kind of computer, even on a phone, that your customer is using, they can read PDFs. For a long time, you had to download a PDF reader. In most cases, it was Adobe's Acrobat reader on your Windows machine to read PDFs. That's not even true anymore. Um, Microsoft's Edge browser, which is available on all modern PCs, uh, in fact, it comes with Windows 10 now, can easily open read PDFs. On the Macintosh Preview, which comes with every Mac, can read PDFs. Most phones can read PDFs. So this is a, a good format because almost everybody can read it. PDFs can be malicious. And in fact, I'm going to talk about how a data file of any kind can be malicious. A bad guy to infect your computer, whether it's with ransomware, a Trojan horse, malware, um, even just a keystroke logger, has to get you to run a program. Those are programs. They have to get you to run that program to install it and make the changes to the operating system so that it loads up every time you boot the computer up. So a lot of times what hackers are up to is to kind of tricking you into running programs. Data files in their purest form are not programs. They cannot infect you. But there is a path to infection, and, there's, and I'll, I'll explain those. One of the reasons I don't like to use Microsoft Office documents when I'm sending attachments is because Excel, Word, they can contain scripts, macros. Most antiviruses are smart enough, and in fact, Word and Excel are smart enough to say, hey, there's a macro attached to this document. Make sure it's safe before you run it. In many cases, won't run it at all. And that's because 
word macro viruses or a very early kind of virus and and were a real problem. So sometimes data files can run programs. Most of the time, though, data files are benign. They're just data. You're a photo in a JPEG form or a PDF document. In theory, they shouldn't execute anything. The problem is the program that's used to run or view that data file. We call them interpreters. So Adobe Acrobat interprets PDF files. And the problem is, Acrobat's a good example, there have been numerous flaws discovered in Acrobat that allow a maliciously created PDF file to infect your computer. It takes advantage of the fact that Acrobat is a program, Reader is a program, and the PDF file can give that program instructions which it then interprets and runs and infects your computer. So in general, interpreters are potentially risky and they have to, we have to be very carefully crafted so as not to allow a data file to infect them. Similarly, a JPEG by itself is harmless, but if you had a JPEG viewing program, and this has happened as well, that had a flaw in it and the bad guys knew what that flaw was, they could craft a malicious JPEG, a malicious image file that by itself is harmless, but when read with that particular buggy program could become malicious. So it's not really the case that you can say data files are safe. They're safe as long as the programs used to interpret them, to display them are, sa are, are not buggy. So that's why it's always important to keep everything up to date on your computer, especially these ca this category of programs like Adobe Reader. Very important. So is it possible that you got sent a malicious PDF? Yes, it is. Is it likely? No, it's not. <laughs> And this is part of the problem I have with any viruses. There's two problems. And we've talked about false negatives and false positives in other contexts before. But that's a problem with antivirus programs. Sometimes, often, they miss a virus. They, they, they let a virus through, a false negative, And it infects your computer even though you're running an antivirus. Sometimes, in fact, maybe even just as often, they identify something that is not malicious as malicious. In this case, I think it's probable that Norton saw the PDF, understood the potential problems with the PDF, and either told you that they fixed it or maybe they did, in fact, find something. This message that you got is interesting to me. A script that could enable malware has been removed. A PDF is, in a way, a script. What a PDF stores is programs, a program that displays the page. The program used to be in PostScript, then Display PostScript, and now it's in its own kind of format, but it's actually a program. So it is conceivable that a PDF, when executed improperly by a program that allows it, could have a malware, as I mentioned. By itself, though, it doesn't. And I'm not sure what Norton saw. It's much more likely, in, in other words, that this was a false positive, that the file was fine. It's certainly not enough evidence to get this guy in trouble. Is it possible he sent you completely innocently a malformed PDF? Absolutely. His system could be infected. Perhaps the PDF creation tool that he used to make that invoice, maybe Acrobat Distiller or some other program, Cute PDF, or you know, there are lots of them, Foxit Pro. Maybe those programs had a bug and a bad guy got on his system and modified those programs so that they would create malicious PDFs. That's also possible. And the problem is I can't tell you exactly what happened. And this is why, I, in general, I don't recommend any viruses on personal computers, you know, as a personal thing. Norton saw it, but you're running Windows 10. Did Windows Defender see it? No, right? You didn't get two warnings. Um, you might run that attachment it's possible it's been modified now, but if you could download another copy from your mail provider and run it through another antivirus program, there are a lot of online ones, Trend Micro, for instance, and, and get a second opinion, that might be useful. I often see antivirus programs falsely tag files as dangerous. I can't say for sure that something bad didn't happen, but I also can't say for sure that something bad did happen. Do you know what I'm saying? It, there's just not enough evidence. 
I, I think it's unlikely the chain of uh, events that would lead to this happening for real and really be a threat to you are somewhat unlikely. He would have to be hacked. He would have had to create a malicious PDF, which he would have then sent to you. It was only detected by Norton, not by anything else. And then Norton says very conveniently, oh, don't worry, I removed it. All of that seems unlikely. It's probably the case that you didn't get bit. And this is exactly why you've heard me say many times, I'm not crazy about antivirus programs because of the false positive, false negative aspect. They slow your computer down. Norton's notorious for that. They're very heavyweight. They can cause more problems than they solve. They can even have flaws themselves that allow bad guys to get into your system. So this is an example of perhaps Norton being overcautious or identifying something wrong. But again, I can't promise you that there wasn't a malicious PDF. There's really no way to know unless you, you know, got that PDF again and maybe sent it to some people or tried some other antiviruses against it. Try to get a second or third or fourth opinion if you can. If only one antivirus flags something as, as malicious, then chances are really good that's a false positive. Hey, great! it's a great question, and at least it gives us a chance to kind of think a little bit about how we can get infected by data files. Uh, in general, that's not because the data file itself has an infection or has uh, it could be a maliciously crafted, but by itself it's harmless unless you've got a program, the interpreting program, that's going to take that file and turn it into something dangerous. So you probably weren't at risk anyway, presuming that you view PDFs as something that's been kept up to date. If you use Adobe Reader, that's one you really got to keep up to date. In fact, it's one I would get rid of. It had so many problems for so many years. Just use Edge. Microsoft's keeping that up to date. Or view it in Gmail's uh, preview or Google Docs PDF Reader. Even if it's malicious, that will be safe. That's why, by the way, I always say don't send attachments. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment to explain why real hams can't drive down Weaver Street. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli. W2XOY. Three memorable events occurred in my life in 1971. I turned 18, I graduated from high school, and I passed my general. To celebrate, I bought myself an old VW bus and installed radios for 11, 10, 6, and 2 meters. Thus began my lifelong love of mobile operations. I soon encountered a problem. The VW bus was 76 inches tall. With four antennas on the roof, my total height was 136 inches, or 11 feet 4 inches. I had a park on the street, as the driveway at my parents' house had an 8-foot clearance by the back door. Parking garages were now off-limits. Still, except for these two restrictions, I had no problems in getting around. My hometown, Buffalo, New York, is very flat and is laid out in a combination of a spoke and grid pattern. Clearances under railroad bridges were at least 12 feet. No street was off limits. Even when I upgraded to a Ford Econoline van, 80 inches tall, my overall height was only 11 feet 8 inches, low enough to make it under any bridge. I had a ball mobile, working hundreds of stations across town and across the world. When I moved to Albany, New York in the early 80s, however, I ran into trouble. Unlike Buffalo, the Capital District of New York is not centralized. It consists of three medium-sized cities and half a dozen smaller cities and villages hemmed in by hills, valleys, and two major rivers. It is also a far older area than Buffalo, filled with densely populated narrow streets that climb steep hills and twist and turn through small valleys. In many areas, there was simply no room to allow for adequate clearances under bridges. As a result, there are over 10 bridges with clearances less than 11 feet. One is just three blocks from my office. I had a choice, put on shorter antennas or learn alternate routes. I kept the antennas, of course. It wasn't hard to find other streets, and soon I thought I had the problem solved until I came to Weaver Street. 
I was living in Rotterdam, a suburb of Schenectady. According to the map, the shortest distance from point A, my house, to point B, downtown Schenectady, was down Weaver Street. I set out one day on a trip downtown. I never made it. I turned onto Weaver Street. One hundred feet later, I saw the sign and the bridge. The clearance, eight feet, nine inches. I came to a complete stop, with cars honking behind me. I couldn't believe it. Eight feet, nine inches on a major street? I made a U-turn and went home. I looked at the Ford van and I asked myself, are these antennas really worth it? I got in the van, drove around, and worked Scotland and the Virgin Islands repeater on 10 meter FM, came home and said, yes. And so I avoided Weaver Street. I eventually traded the van in for a Ford Escort wagon. The wagon was only 56 inches tall, but my problem actually became worse. For, at the same time I got the Escort, I also bought an ICOM 725 HF mobile rig and ham sticks for 75 through 10 meters. The ham sticks were 8 feet tall. With a 4 inch spring, my total height was now 13 feet. Dozens of streets were now off limits, not just because of low bridges, but also because of trees and even some cable or power lines. My parents had also moved to the Albany area, but, shades of 1971, I couldn't pull in their driveway thanks to a cable line only 11 feet high. Believe it or not, that wasn't the worst. The Escort was equipped with the ICOM HF rig, a 6-meter sideband radio, a dual-band mobile unit, a 10-meter FM rig, and a CB radio. How did I fit all of these in an Escort? Simple. I turned the front passenger seat into a radio platform. My two kids were young at the time, and they rode in the back seat. When we went out as a family, we took my wife's minivan. On the rare occasions we had to use my car, the wife and kids were crammed into the back of the Escort while the radios rode shotgun. Yes, they complained, but I had 37 states and 31 countries logged. The radios and antennas stayed. But times change and life evolves. The ICOM developed a transmit problem, the tri-mag mount corroded, the kids were growing, and the Escort was old. I traded in the old wife for a newer, vastly improved model, and got a great deal, and the Escort for a Hyundai. The new car was smaller than the Escort and had only two doors. For a change of pace, I decided on a radically different approach. The radio presence in the Hyundai would be minimal. A dual band HT and a small CB. Both easily fit in the center console. A three foot mag mount on the trunk and a dual band glass mount were the only antennas. My new height was only 76 inches or 6 feet 4 inches. New worlds were opened up to me. I discovered something called the drive through wherein one can purchase food or conduct banking business from the comfort of the driver's seat. I explored the inside of something called a parking garage and marveled at my ability to drive unimpeded through such a structure. I enjoyed the sensation of actually having my passenger sit next to me instead of somewhere behind me. And I drove down Weaver Street. I was scared. I watched my speedometer as I approached the bridge. 10, 20, 30 miles per hour. I braced for the impact, but nothing happened. People no longer stared at my car. My kids were no longer embarrassed to ride with me. My wife was happy. But I wasn't. There was a void in my life that couldn't be filled with QSOs on the local repeater. And I started to hear the whispers. The voices kept saying, If you call CQ, they will answer. Like I said earlier, times change and life evolves. My older daughter is now 17, has her driver's license and her own car. My driving patterns changed, and 99% of the time I drive alone or with only one passenger. In 2003, I turned 50. It was time for my midlife crisis. I bought a Yaesu FT8900 quad band rig. 
and an ICOM IC718 HF radio. I dug out my hamsticks. My coworker, Jim, KE2YZ, gave me a tri-mag mount. And so, one Saturday morning, I once again turned the front passenger seat into a radio platform and increased my vehicle's height to 13 feet. My younger daughter isn't too keen on riding in the back seat, and I got the look of death from my wife when she had a ride back there. Once again, I am banished from dozens of streets. I abandoned Weaver Street, the drive throughs and the parking garages without a backward glance. My car draws stares from people on the street. I can't pull in my parents' driveway anymore. Was it worth it? I check into e-cars and the 1010 net on a regular basis. I can work Europe on my 10-minute commute to work. And I can access 10-meter repeaters from Florida to Texas. For me, the answer is yes. The voices are satisfied, and I am complete. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. Foundations of Amateur Radio. I'm looking at components. Not looking for, looking at. I have them sitting on the bench in front of me. A collection of six variable capacitors and six inductors. There's also a germanium diode, a breadboard, some connecting wires and two connectors. I don't quite need that many capacitors or inductors and truth be told a breadboard is overkill but I found myself getting into the spirit of things and for the tiny investment it seems like the thing to get whilst you're dipping your toe into the art of electronic circuit prototyping. I'm noticing something odd whilst I'm looking at these components. A familiar feeling in some ways, butterflies in my stomach. It's the exact same feeling as when I sit at the radio getting ready to speak into the microphone, just as I'm starting a weekly radio net, something that I've now done about 480 times, not to mention the times when I did around 1600 interviews, or broadcast live to the world, butterflies. I'm mentioning this because in many ways this is a momentous event. Not for the world, not for humanity, not even for the hobby, but for me. It's the first time I'm building a circuit completely from scratch. No pre-made circuit board, no pre-selected components, no building instructions, just me, some resonance formulas and the hope that I've understood what they represent and that the components I selected will do what my calculations say they should. To make this even less exciting, there's no external power, nothing that's going to go boom or let magic smoke escape, nothing that will break if I get it wrong, but still. The other day I received an email from Phil, Whiskey Foxtrot 3 Whiskey. We've been exchanging email for a couple of years now. He's a member of the Mount Airy VHF Radio Club in Pennsylvania, in the United States. His email outlined an interesting question. What do new amateurs get excited about in this era of the ubiquitous World Wide Web? As a hobby, we're attracting new members every day. Many of those are coming to the community by way of social media, rather than using things that are more traditionally considered radio, like HFDX, making long-distance contact using HF radio, rather than exchanging pithy emails or instant messages via the interconnectedness of the globe-encompassing behemoth of the Internet. The answer came easily to me, since last week we had a new amateur, Dave, Victor Kilo 6 Delta Mike, who made his very first long-distance HF contact between Australia and the United States. His level of excitement was contagious, and that's something that I found happens regularly. Someone talks about magnetic loop antennas, and the next thing, six amateurs are building them. One person starts playing with satellites, and before you know it, Yagis are being built and people are describing their adventures. The same is true with my crystal radio. I've talked about it a couple of times and people are digging out their old kits and telling stories about how they grew up with their dad making a crystal radio. That's what's exciting the new amateurs. The internet is just an excuse to find each other. Just like F Troop is an excuse for people to turn on their communications tool of choice at midnight UTC on a Saturday morning to talk about amateur radio for an hour. My excitement comes from trying new things. And just like keying a microphone for the first time, there's this almost visceral experience of anticipation associated with starting. I'm still working out how I want to build my new toy and how to go about testing to see if it actually works and what to look for if it doesn't. 
I'm trying hard to resist tooling up with crazy tools like signal generators and oscilloscopes, instead opting to use things I already have, like LC meters and my ears. I can't wait until I can share how it goes. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is W2XBS with this week's propagation forecast for Friday, November 6, 2020. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that the 10.7 centimeter solar flux density was 88.1 on this past Wednesday, November 4th, the highest since November 14th of 2016 when it was 92.8. The average daily solar flux for that week was 76.9 and average daily sunspot number was 18.7, so activity four years ago was similar to recent activity. But in 2016, solar cycle 24 was declining, reaching a minimum about three years later in December 2019. In the coming days, the geomagnetic field will be quiet on November 6th through the 7th, 9th through the 11th, and December 1st through the 2nd. It'll be quiet to unsettled on November 8th, 12th through the 15th, 19th, 26th through the 27th, and November 30th. It'll be quiet to active on November 16th through the 18th and 22nd through the 25th. Now the AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5DO. A few weeks ago, it was announced another satellite was going to be launched. On November 5th, Neutron 1 was deployed from the International Space Station. The beacon will transmit 1200 BPS BPSK every 60 seconds. After commissioning, which will take about 30 days, the satellite will be turned on for amateur use depending on the power budget. The uplink will be on 145.84 and the downlink on 435.3 MHz, both FM. We look forward to a long life and congratulate the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory for its work on this satellite. There are more satellites scheduled for launch in the next few months. AMSAT's RAD FXSAT-2 or FOX-1E, the final satellite in the FOX series, is expected to launch by the end of the year. Tevel mission is a series of eight Israeli one-unit CubeSats with FM transponders expected to launch in December. Two pocket cubes are scheduled to launch in December as well, ESAT-2 and Hades. If you need some missing grid squares in Maine, KL7TN will be roving from November 13th through the 18th and plans to hit nine main grids. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I got this question by email, which deals with the subject I prefer to avoid, tower guy wires. This is not one that can be easily or properly covered in a four-minute radio segment. I suggest you refer to the many fine publications available on the Internet and from organizations like the ARL on the subject. I do not own a guide tower. All of mine are freestanding, but I work on commercial guide towers. If you have the right climbing hardware, a ride down the guy wires can be lots of fun, too. Don't tell anybody I said that, please. If your ham tower is guide but is designed to be freestanding and you have to replace the guy wires, here's a simple guideline for the procedure to replace them. First of all, if available, check any literature or web pages about wind loading and guy wire strength. I suppose thicker is better, but heavier guys droop and look bad. So the best bet is to accurately add up all the wind loads for your hardware on your tower and the tower itself. Then use that to select the proper gauge guy wires. On a small home tower, you can fudge the mount point of the guy wires at the tower by a couple of inches. So fabricate another tower anchor for your guys and simply install the new ones right above the old ones. Check for tightness and strength before removing the old wires. I would let the two systems coexist as neighbors for a period of time to stretch the new wires before the old ones are removed. After the break-in period, I paint seal the turnbuckles and other guide wire adjustment points to watch for broken seals and hence slipping guy system mounts. A good seal for guy wire hardware is regular old fingernail polish. I use that stuff for lots of electronic projects from color coding network wires and coax runs to guy anchors and sealing pots. Just a little hint, the best time to buy fingernail polish for color coding is around and after Halloween. That's when all the weird oddball colors like black and orange are in stores. You may need to reseal turnbuckles and bolts as the fingernail polish shrinks and fades with time. 
As with any tower project, strength is of utmost importance. Always design and build for far worse weather than you can anticipate in your area. Over time, all mechanical systems weaken. So prepare for this effect by designing in extra strength and some degree of flexibility. Also keep in mind that during the change of seasons, the size of metal objects change like nuts and bolts. So a trip up the tower early in the winter and summer to check for damage and tight bolts and nuts is always time well spent. As with any tower work, money spent on climbing books and videos is well worth it. You should review your safety climbing materials every year, just like your recertified as a Skywarn spotter. Do this for yourself. Remember to play safety ahead of everything in all your tower work. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position. An amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. The 3U Neutron 1 CubeSat is scheduled for deployment from the International Space Station on November 5th at 1040 UTC. For the satellite's first month and during its commissioning phase, the Neutron 1 beacon will transmit 1200 BPS BPSK telemetry every 60 seconds on 435.3 MHz. Developed by the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the satellite's payload includes a VUFM amateur radio repeater during available times and according to the spacecraft's power budget. The Neutron 1 science mission is spelled out in a formal paper, Neutron 1 Mission, Low Earth Orbit Neutron Flux Detection, and Cosmos Mission Operations Technology Demonstration. HSFL operates and maintains a satellite UHF, VHF, and LS band amateur radio ground station at Kauai Community College. The primary mission of Neutron 1 is to measure the low energy neutron flux in low Earth orbit. The science payload, a small neutron detector developed by Arizona State University, will focus on measurements of low-energy secondary neutrons, a component of the LEO neutron environment. A number of other amateur radio satellites are expected to launch or deploy in the next few months. AMSAT's RADFXSAT-2 FOX-1E is expected to go into orbit by year's end on Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 vehicle. Rad FX Sat 2 carries a 30 kHz wide VU linear transponder. The Tavel mission, a series of eight Israeli 1U CubeSats, each carrying a UV FM transponder, is expected to launch from India on SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in December. Also from the Herzliya Science Center is a 3U CubeSat called Tau Sat 1, which is scheduled to launch on a Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency ISS resupply mission in February for subsequent deployment. TauSat-1 carries an FM transponder. AMSAT Spain reports that its pocket cubes EASAT-2 and Hades have integrated for launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 in December, while Genesis L and Genesis N have been integrated for launch on Firefly's Alpha rocket. In other amateur satellite news, Jerome Lacayer, F4DXV, set yet another record, this time via EO88 on October 28th, working Vladimir Veseljev, RN9LR, at a distance of 4,560 kilometers, or 2,827 miles. F4DXV is now a distance record contact partner on 10 LEO satellites. 
while R9LR is a contact partner for records set on four LEO satellites. AMSAT tracks claimed distance records. Researchers at the National Institute of Standards and Technology have devised and demonstrated a system that could dramatically increase the performance of communication networks while enabling record low error rates and detecting even the faintest of signals. This has the potential to cut the total amount of energy required for state-of-the-art networks by a factor of 10 to 100. The proof of principle system consists of a novel receiver and corresponding signal processing techniques entirely based on the properties of quantum physics and able to handle extremely weak signals with pulses that carry many bits of data. We built the communication testbed using off-the-shelf components to demonstrate that quantum measurement enabled communication can potentially be scaled up for widespread commercial use, said Ivan Burenkoff, a physicist at the Joint Quantum Institute, a research partnership between NIST and the University of Maryland. Birenkoff and his colleagues reported the results in Physical Review X Quantum. Our efforts show that quantum measurements offer valuable, heretofore unforeseen advantages for telecommunications leading to revolutionary improvements in channel bandwidth and energy efficiency, Birenkoff added. Modern communication systems work by converting information into a laser-generated stream of digital light pulses in which information is encoded in the form of changes to the properties of the light waves for transfer and then decoded when it reaches the receiver. The train of pulses grows fainter as it travels along transmission channels and conventional electronic technology for receiving and decoding data has reached the limit of its ability to precisely detect the information in such attenuated signals. The signal pulse can dwindle until it is as weak as a few photons or even less than one on average. At that point, inevitable random quantum fluctuations called shot noise make accurate reception impossible by normal technology because the uncertainty caused by the noise makes up such a large part of the diminished signal. As a result, existing systems must amplify the signals repeatedly along the transmission line at considerable energy cost, keeping them strong enough to detect reliably. The NIS team's system can eliminate the need for amplifiers because it can reliably process even extremely feeble signal pulses. The total energy required to transmit one bit becomes a fundamental factor hindering the development of networks, said Sergei Polakov, senior scientist on the NIST team. The goal is to reduce the sum of energy required by lasers, amplifiers, detectors, and support equipment to reliably transmit information over longer distances. For 50 years, the German town of Bad Bentheim has hosted the Deutsche Niederlandische Amateur Funker Tage, or German Dutch Amateur Radio Days, in which the town stresses the importance of amateur radio as a public service. Nominations are open until April 21st of 2021. A committee headed by the mayor of Bad Bentheim will choose the winner. The recipient will be invited to Bad Bentheim, Germany, to receive the award, which will be presented August 28th of 2021. The award recognizes an individual radio operator or a group for outstanding humanitarian performance. In 2021, we'd favor candidates who did something special related to the pandemic. But other candidates are welcome, said Jan G. Stodman, PA1TT slash DJ5AN, who chairs the committee. Send your nominations to Stod Bad Bentheim, Post Office Box 1452, D48445, Bad Bentheim, Germany, or submit via email. And finally this week, amateurs who have great enthusiasm for various modes of digital operation are getting some more company on the air, just in a different part of the spectrum. According to our colleagues at Newsline, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission has told commercial AM radio stations that they will be allowed to convert to an all-digital broadcast if they are presently using analog or hybrid of analog and digital signals. The station's changes are to be voluntary. The FCC's late October announcement clears the way for AM stations to provide an all-digital signal that gives better coverage over a wider area of listeners and enables the signal to carry additional information, such as the title and artist of the particular song, and details that are visible on a compatible digital receiver. 
The stations are required, however, to notify the FCC at least 30 days before making their change. They are still required to be a part of the emergency alert system. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the Internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Accra, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved. You've just listened to a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version.